Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation, making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida at aaronv.com. You're listening to episode 104 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about acupuncture. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. For centuries, people have been practicing acupuncture to treat a variety of conditions. The procedure involves sticking needles at various points in the body. Advocates claim that the practice can effectively treat headaches, back pain, arthritis, insomnia, allergies, Alzheimer's disease, depression, cancer, and a host of other conditions. But critics claim that acupuncture is nothing more than pseudoscience and people are being bilked out of their money on fake treatments. So what's the truth about acupuncture? How is it supposed to work? And what can it really treat? Or is it all just pseudoscience? That's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. So, Jimmy, this is a special patrons episode, right? Yes, one of our patrons. In fact, our current sponsor, Aaron Ferguson, requested that we do an episode on acupuncture. He asked for it as a birthday present for his wife, and we gave him early access to the episode so we could surprise her with it. So happy birthday, Mrs. Ferguson. Happy birthday. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) We'll also have some special bonus information about acupuncture for Mrs. Ferguson. And in honor of her birthday, everyone else will get to hear it. So be sure to stick around for that later in the program. Excellent. I understand we need to give a, a minor caution. So what's that about? Well, since this episode is on acupuncture, we will be talking about poking people with needles. We'll also be very briefly discussing some surgery. As always, we will keep things clinical and won't dwell on gory details. But if you're especially sensitive, you should be aware. All right, let's begin by talking about the history of acupuncture. How far back does acupuncture go? We're not sure. The earliest written records of it go back to first century to the first century BC in China. It's mentioned in a medical work known as the Huangdi Neijing, or the Yellow Emperor's Classic of Internal Medicine. Ostensibly, it is much older than the first century BC because Huangdi, or the Yellow Emperor, allegedly lived around 2600 BC. However, modern scholars hold that he's a legendary figure and that the work actually dates to just the first century BC, and afterwards it became the most important text in traditional Chinese medicine. But even though that's when it was first written about, at least that we have a record of, it was probably in use for a while before it got written down. Recently, some have claimed that acupuncture is thousands of years older. You may remember that in 1991, two German tourists found a mummified body that had been buried in a glacier in the Alps on the border of Austria and Italy. He's popularly known as Otzi the Iceman, and he died more than 5,000 years ago, around 3300 BC, when he was murdered. When modern scholars investigated, it was discovered that he had some lines tattooed on his body. And when modern acupuncturists saw them, they said, oh, that's where we put the needles for a person suffering from lower back pain and abdominal pain. So it's been proposed that he had these tattoos either for purposes of acupuncture, acupressure or some similar procedure. But this strikes me as speculative, as it's thousands of years earlier and from a completely different culture. So I'm not convinced that these are acupuncture, and neither are some other medical experts, but it's it's not impossible. My guess is that variations on acupuncture have been invented multiple times in human history in multiple different cultures. I mean, after all, Poking at something when it hurts is a natural thing to do, and there's a reason we do it, which we'll be getting into later. In fact, the archaeological record shows that more than 8,000 years ago, people were performing trepanation, or 
drilling holes in people's heads. That was likely done in some cases in an attempt to alleviate headaches. So you could think of it as a kind of extreme version of poking the thing that hurts or super macho acupuncture. (laughs) So my guess is that some form of acupuncture likely goes back into prehistory, but it wasn't the same form we're familiar with, which is based on traditional Chinese medicine. Here we'll be focusing on the form of acupuncture that's popular today, which originated in China. So what is its history? As you'd expect with any practice that's been around for at least 2,000 years, it's changed forms over time. And we'll be mentioning some alternate forms of acupuncture that have been developed, including ones just that have come up very recently. Originally, acupuncture was coupled with the practice of bloodletting, which was common in the East, just like it was in the West. You see this in the Yellow Emperor's Classic of Internal Medicine, which talks about using bloodletting in conjunction with acupuncture to relieve various conditions. The idea behind acupuncture is that there are certain channels in the body, some of which carry blood, we obviously know those as blood vessels, and some of which carry a life force known as qi or qi. And you can fix medical problems by manipulating these two substances. Sometimes you need to manipulate the blood, and sometimes you need to manipulate the chi. It's possible that bloodletting eventually developed into acupuncture, that it was the earlier practice, but that, you know, poking a hole in someone doesn't always result in bleeding, but you still might think it has a therapeutic effect, and so maybe that's how acupuncture got started. Eventually, Chinese metal workers discovered how to forge steel, and this became a preferred material for acupuncture needles. In the early centuries A.D., the needles were quite a bit thicker than they are today. I mean, now acupuncturists use really, really thin ones. The early needles, though, could leave a good size hole in you and could cause infection as well as blood loss. So one solution was to heat them up with fire or boiling water and then insert them while they were still hot to cauterize the point of insertion. Another related practice involving fire that often accompanied acupuncture is moxibustion. And to me, that just sounds like a great name for a 1930s lady crime fighter, moxibustion. (laughs) In moxibustion, you take the dried herb mugwort or moxa and burn it or combust it. So it's mugwort combustion or moxibustion. You do this at specific points on the body, including the same points used for acupuncture. Sometimes practitioners will put a little cone or cigar of moxa on the skin at the acupuncture point and burn it until the skin blisters, although sometimes they'll take it off before blistering occurs. Other times they'll stick the cigar of moxa on an acupuncture needle and then insert the needle and set fire to the uh, moxa. The idea is to warm up the acupuncture point, and increase the flow of blood and or chi. The first millennium AD seems to have been a kind of golden age for acupuncture. It was popular uh, both with the Chinese aristocracy and with peasants. They even sent doctors to other countries like Korea and Japan to teach them about Chinese medical practices like acupuncture. But in the second millennium, the popularity of acupuncture started to wane. According to some sources, this happened by about the year 1300, by which time acupuncture was being looked on as a lower class superstition that was associated with other disreputable practices like midwivery, (laughs) which was apparently disreputable for some reason. Hmm. However, during the Ming Dynasty around the year 1600, a major book was published called The Great Compendium of Acupuncture and Moxibustion which formed the basis of later acupuncture. After Europeans came into contact with China in the age of exploration, they learned about the practice. Jesuit missionaries brought it back to France in the 1500s, and the Surgeon General of the Dutch East India Company learned about it and wrote to the folks back home. He was the one that coined the the term acupuncture, or in Latin, acupunctura, which he used in a book he published in 1683. It's based on the roots acus, which means a needle in Latin, and punctus, or a pricking. So acupuncture is needle pricking. Acupuncture didn't become common in the West, though there were periodic fads where it would have kind of temporary popularity. 
Meanwhile, back in China, its reputation had declined so much that by the mid-1700s, it could be referred to as a lost art. And in 1822, the Chinese emperor known as the Daoguang Emperor forbade it at the Imperial Medical Institute, saying it was unfit for gentlemen and scholars to practice. It came back for a while, but in 1929, the Republic of China banned it again in favor of Western science-based medicine. When communists came to power in 1949, they originally regarded it as a superstition that was incompatible with communist ideology, but then Chairman Mao reversed this view. Although he himself did not use acupuncture, he allowed many traditional Chinese medical practices to come back. If acupuncture wasn't common in the West back then, how did it become so popular today? In 1972, President Richard Nixon made his famous trip to China. There is an old Vulcan proverb. Only Nixon could go to China. To set up for the trip, Nixon's national security advisor, Henry Kissinger, went to China the year before, in 1971. And in the press corps covering Kissinger's trip was New York Times author and CIA asset, (laughs) James Reston. And while he was in Beijing, which was then called Peking, he came down with appendicitis. So they rushed him to the hospital and took out his appendix. At first, there were no complications, but two nights later, he started having abdominal problems. When he got back to the U.S., he wrote a rather flippant piece that appeared on the front page of the New York Times called, Now About My Operation in Peking, in which he said, I was in considerable discomfort, if not pain, during the second night after the operation, and Li Chang Huan, doctor of acupuncture at the hospital, with my approval, inserted three long, thin needles into the outer part of my right elbow and below my knees and manipulated them in order to stimulate the intestine and relieve the pressure and distension of the stomach. That sent ripples of pain racing through my limbs and at least had the effect of diverting my attention from the distress in my stomach. Meanwhile, Dr. Lee lit two pieces of an herb called ai, which looked like the burning stumps of a broken cheap cigar, and held them close to my abdomen while occasionally twirling the needles into action. All this took about 20 minutes, during which I remember thinking that it was rather a complicated way to get rid of gas on the stomach, but there was a noticeable relaxation of the pressure and distension within an hour, and no recurrence of the problem thereafter. So the doctor did acupuncture with moxibustion on him. Reston's piece then did a lot to stimulate interest in acupuncture in America, and soon doctors were going over to China to witness the practice for themselves. In their book, Trick or Treatment, The Undeniable Facts About Alternative Medicine, Dr. Edzard Erst, who is a uh, professor of complementary medicine at the University of Exeter, and his co-author, Simon Singh, write about what the American doctors who went to China saw. During the early 1970s, these observers witnessed truly staggering examples of Chinese acupuncture. Perhaps the most impressive demonstration was the use of acupuncture during major surgery. A certain Dr. Isidore Rosenfeld, for instance, visited the hospital at the University of Shanghai and reported on the case of a 28-year-old female patient who underwent open-heart surgery to repair her mitral valve. Astonishingly, The surgeon used acupuncture on her left earlobe in place of the usual anesthetics. The surgeon cut through the breastbone with an electric buzzsaw and opened her chest to reveal her heart. Dr. Rosenfeld described how she remained awake and alert throughout. She never flinched. There was no mask on her face, no intravenous needle in her arm. I took a color photograph of that memorable scene, the open chest, the smiling patient, and the surgeon's hands holding her heart. I show it to anyone who scoffs at acupuncture. Such extraordinary cases documented by reputable doctors had an immediate effect back in America. Physicians were clamoring to attend the three-day crash courses in acupuncture that were running in both America and China, and increasing numbers of acupuncture needles were being imported into America. At the same time, American legislators were deciding what to make of this newfound medical marvel because there had been no formal assessment of whether or not acupuncture really worked. Similarly, there had been no investigation into the safety of acupuncture implements, 
which was why the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, attempted to prevent shipments of needles from entering the United States. Eventually, the FDA softened its position and accepted the importation of acupuncture needles under the label of experimental devices. The governor of California, Ronald Reagan, took a similar line, and in August 1972, he signed into law a bill that permitted acupuncture, but only in approved medical schools and only so that scientists might test its safety and efficacy. But now we were off to the races, and acupuncture quickly became an accepted alternative medical practice in the United States and other parts of the Western world. In fact, as early as 1973, the Internal Revenue Service started allowing you to write off acupuncture as a medical expense. All right, so how is acupuncture supposed to work? There's a big debate about that. Basically, there are two models. There's the traditional explanation, which relies on concepts from traditional Chinese medicine that are not recognized in Western science. And there's a more recent explanation that seeks to explain acupuncture in terms of things that are recognized in Western science. Okay, let's talk about the traditional form first. How does it say that acupuncture works? It's based on Taoism, which is a Chinese folk religion and philosophical system. Taoism emphasizes living in accord with the Tao or the way, you know, the right way to live. This is the way. A, <laughs> yeah. a, a famous work of Taoism that you may have heard of is the Tao Te Ching, which is credited to the sage Lao Tzu who lived around 500 B.C. Also, you've almost certainly seen the yin-yang symbol, the circle that looks like it contains a big black comma wrestling with a big white comma. That's a Taoist symbol. The yin is the black part, and the yang is the white part. The two concepts are important in Taoism, and they represent contrasting cosmic forces. Yin is the female or negative principle characterized by darkness, wetness, coldness, and passivity, which is why yin is the black shape in the symbol. Yang is the masculine or positive principle characterized by light, warmth, dryness, and activity, which is why it's the white shape in the symbol. And if those characterizations seem a little misogynistic to you, well, I wouldn't argue. <laughs> Here's how Ben Cavusi, who trained to become an acupuncturist, though he seems to have become a skeptic, described the traditional account of how acupuncture arose in the untold story of acupuncture, and specifically how the, how the forces are supposed to work and how they're connected to the points on your body. In China, the numinous qi was believed to mirror the sun's annual journey around the celestial sphere and to circulate in a network of 12 primary meridians, which run from head to toes and interconnect approximately 360 points on the skin. There is a strong possibility that the web of these channels was a rudimentary model of the vascular system that was conceptualized according to a set of fundamental beliefs based on astrological principles. Each channel was believed to be linked to a specific internal organ system and to a two-hour, 30-degree house of the Chinese zodiac system. Each channel was named according to its degree of yin and yang, which are also terms that describe the phases of the sun and the moon. Each channel has five special points designated by the characters for water, wood, fire, earth, and metal, which are also the Chinese terms for Mercury, Jupiter, Mars, Saturn, and Venus. The journey of qi in the body is often described in terms such as, quote, The major premise of Chinese medical theory is that all the forms of life in the universe are animated by an essential life force or vital energy called qi. Qi also means breath or air, invisible, tasteless, odorless, and formless. Qi nevertheless permeates the entire cosmos. Qi is transferable and transmutable. Digestion extracts qi from the food and drink and transfers it to the body. Breathing extracts qi from the air and transfers it to the lungs. When these two forms of qi meet in the bloodstream, they transmute to form human qi, which then circulates throughout the body as vital energy. It is the quality and balance of your qi that determines your state of health and span of life. 
So the meridians, or channels for the flow of qi, are characterized by different degrees of yin and yang, and various factors, including astrological ones, affect the flow of life force, or qi, in the body. Furthermore, if the qi gets stopped up, so its proper flow is interrupted, this will cause health problems, and by inserting acupuncture needles, you can fix this and restore the qi to its proper flow, curing the person of their health problem. It's interesting to note that the meridians did not follow blood vessels, at least not closely. They did somewhat. And the reason for that is, just like in the West, dissection was originally forbidden in China. So nobody knew the details of internal anatomy. They didn't know exactly where the blood vessels were. However, over time, more and more acupuncture points were proposed, with the points usually follow, falling on one meridian or another. And by around the 1600s, when the Great Compendium was published, 365 acupuncture points had been identified. Since that time, there have been many more, and today there are thousands that have been proposed. If that's the traditional explanation for acupuncture, how did the newer non-traditional explanation come about? As modern science developed, the concepts involved in traditional acupuncture came to be seen as problematic. Yin and yang and qi have not been verified as forces of nature by modern science. They are not, for example, among the fundamental forces of nature. There are four of those. We've talked about them in previous episodes, gravity, electromagnetism, and the strong and weak nuclear forces. Since yin and yang are supposed to be cosmic forces, you would expect them to be discovered by physicists, or at least some kind of scientists, but they haven't been. Neither have physicists or chemists or physicians found anything corresponding to qi. I mean, they found blood, flowing through channels in our bodies, but not qi. The meridians were also associated with the five elements of classical Chinese alchemy, earth, fire, water, metal, and wood. But modern chemistry no longer acknowledges those as distinct elements. I mean, we've got, you know, 118 elements presently, and none of them are earth, fire, water, metal, or wood. And as Western science developed, it also undermined the idea of astrology, including Chinese astrology. And that made the astrological ideas associated with acupuncture problematic. I mean, for example, the fact that in the Great Compendium, there were 365 acupuncture points on the human body is clearly based on the number of days in the Earth's orbit. And similarly, the different points reflecting the influence of the planets or, you know, the f motions of the sun and the moon and their influence on yin and yang, all of those became undermined as astrology got undermined. Do you still find practitioners who adhere to the traditional explanation of acupuncture? Yes, you do. You'll certainly find practitioners who explain acupuncture in terms of manipulating the flow of chi in the body, although the details of how that works vary. In fact, I recently came across a web page where the author was trying to map Western astrology onto the concepts from acupuncture. So you could have Western astrological acupuncture. But as modern Western science progressed, the classical explanation of acupuncture came to be seen as increasingly shaky. And so some people started looking for explanations that would make sense of it in terms of concepts that Western science has recognized. What does a, a modern explanation of acupuncture look like? In an article in the Oxford Academic Journal Rheumatology called A Brief History of Acupuncture, a. White and E. Ernst write, Ancient concepts of qi flowing in meridians have been displaced in the minds of many practitioners by a neurological model based on evidence that acupuncture needles stimulate nerve endings and alter brain function, particularly the intrinsic pain inhibitory mechanisms. The first magnetic resonance imaging study of acupuncture may also prove to be a landmark. Other workers have noted the marked similarity between the trigger points of Travel with their specific pain referral patterns and the sites of traditional acupuncture points with their associated meridians. There is a plethora of suggested mechanisms of action of acupuncture, but little valid data on which, if any, mechanisms are relevant to clinical practice. So a variety of models have been proposed for acupuncture, linking it in different ways to the nervous system. But there's still a great deal of obscurity. 
One notable change occurred in the 1930s when the Chinese physician Cheng Danan, who is regarded as the foremost acupuncturist of the 20th century, made a number of reforms. He relocated the meridians so that they followed nerve pathways rather than approximating blood vessels. He introduced thinner needles, and he taught that the burning of moxibustion, instead of manipulating qi, helps remove toxins from the body. And he taught that acupuncture works by stimulating the nerves rather than manipulating qi, although he later partially walked back that view. It was largely significantly because of Cheng Danan and his nerve-based approach that acupuncture got a better reputation in many circles today. Also, besides affecting nerve function, other mechanisms for acupuncture effects have been proposed, including it might affect blood flow, it might reduce inflammation in tissues, it may locally release endorphins at acupuncture sites, and it may provide counter-irritation and counter-stimulation, which actually is kind of connected to the nervous system, but we'll be talking about that more later. You mentioned earlier that we would cover alternate forms of acupuncture. What do we need to mention here? Well, we've already mentioned moxibustion, you know, burning herbs like mugwort near the skin in an attempt to warm the site and stimulate the flow of qi. Another traditional practice associated with acupuncture is cupping, which involves putting heated cups on the skin, opening down, to create suction at particular points. There's also acupressure, which involves pressing on a point rather than sticking a needle into it. And of course, many people are much more comfortable with the idea of pressing on a point rather than puncturing it with a needle. Similarly, there's sonopuncture, where you use sound instead of needles. The sound is generated by tuning forks or even by ultrasound transducers. Another very modern variant is electroacupuncture, where you do put in the needles and then you hook them up to wires and you send a current through them. Uh, this is obviously something that was not possible in the past. There is an older practice, fire needle acupuncture, where you use heated needles. And there's acupuncture point injection, where you inject vitamins, herbal extracts, or drugs into acupuncture points. One version of this is bee venom acupuncture, where purified and diluted bee venom is injected. And then there's veterinary acupuncture, where you do acupuncture on animals. So there's a bunch of versions today. It sounds like in these variants, like, let's figure out how to make it worse than just sticking a needle in tears. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that I'd characterize it that way, but I, I like how the, oh, let's just inject somebody with a drug and do it in an acupuncture point works. <laughs> right, right. Let's, it's not enough just stick a needle in. Let's send electricity through it. All right. Yeah. All right. We're going to take a, a quick break here for a very important thing we want to do, which is to thank our patrons. Uh, and here we're going to thank Michael S., Eric R., Patricia S., Joseph S., and Philip C. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. And I do want to suggest that if you listen to Mysterious World but don't listen to the other shows, check out the other shows that Jimmy and I do and others uh, involved with SQPN. We do. They're all found at sqpn.com. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation, making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida at aaronv.com. So, Jimmy, what theories are there about acupuncture? From the reason perspective, there are basically two questions. First, does acupuncture work? And second, if it works, how does it work? From the faith perspective, we need to ask whether or not it works, whether it would be permissible to use it. All right. What can we say about acupuncture from the reason perspective? Before we try to figure out how acupuncture works, we need to figure out if it works. And to do that, we have to fragment the question and ask about specific treatments. I mean, after all, acupuncture might work for one thing, like helping with pain or nausea, but not work for something else, like curing cancer or getting pregnant. Fortunately, since the 1970s, there have been tons of studies done on acupuncture. Unfortunately, most of these are pilot studies. Pilot studies tend to be small scale and not as rigorously controlled as other studies. 
the reason you do a pilot study is as kind of a preliminary check to see if there's merit to a practice that would justify studying it further. If the pilot study shows that there may be merit to it, then you apply for another grant to get more funding to do a bigger and more properly controlled study. The fact that so many of the studies are pilot studies rather than bigger ones should tell you something about what they tend to find. The results of the pilot studies are not very promising. However, that's not what you'll hear if you listen to the World Health Organization, or WHO, which is run by the United Nations. In 2003, the WHO issued a report that was a ringing endorsement of acupuncture. It concluded that acupuncture is proven or has been shown to be effective for 91 conditions, including morning sickness, stroke, and whooping cough. And acupuncture shows some promise, or it's debatable, for another 16 conditions, including deafness and colorblindness. And I hope they're not putting needles in people's eyes for that <sighs> Strikingly, the report did not identify any conditions that acupuncture should not be used for, which is, if you think about it, is a big warning sign mm -hmm. if it says it doesn't say, oh, don't use it for this. Yeah. Unfortunately, the WHO acupuncture report isn't worth a load of fetid dingoes kidneys. First, if you're trusting the United Nations with your health, you need a second opinion. Second. As the recent coronavirus situation has shown us, the WHO is in the pocket of the Chinese communist government and will not report things that make China look bad. But we've known that long before the coronavirus. Here's what Singh and Ernst say in Trick or Treatment. The WHO has an excellent record when it comes to conventional medicine. But in the area of alternative medicine, it seems to prioritize political correctness above truth. In other words, criticism of acupuncture might be perceived as criticism of China, of ancient wisdom, and of Eastern culture as a whole. Moreover, usually when expert panels are assembled in order to review scientific research, the protocol is to include experts with informed but diverse opinions. And crucially, the panel should include critical thinkers who question and challenge any assumptions. Otherwise, the panel's deliberations are a meaningless waste of time and money. However, the WHO acupuncture panel did not include a single critic of acupuncture. It was quite simply a group of believers who, unsurprisingly, were less than objective in their assessment. Most worrying of all, the report was drafted and revised by Dr. Zhu Fan Ji, who was honorary director of the Institute of Integrated Medicines in Beijing, which fully endorses the use of acupuncture for a range of disorders. It is generally inappropriate for someone with such a strong conflict of interest to be so closely involved in writing a medical review. And for purposes of comparison, remember how in our recent episodes on remote viewing, when the CIA commissioned their 1995 analysis of remote viewing data, they did appoint people from different perspectives. You know, you had Dr. Jessica Utz, the statistician who was open to psychic phenomena, and Ray Hyman, the psychologist who was skeptical. And they both got on the panel and they both had the chance to have their say. That's not what happened here. It was all believers. The WHO report also relied heavily on low-quality studies done in China, where the researchers are under the thumb of the Communist Party. Singh and Ernst explained some of the problems with the Chinese acupuncture studies. There is a great deal of suspicion surrounding acupuncture research in China. For example, let's look at acupuncture in the treatment of addiction. Results from Western trials of acupuncture include a mixture of mildly positive equivocal or negative results, with the overall result being negative on balance. By contrast, Chinese trials examining the same intervention always give positive results. This does not make sense, because the efficacy of acupuncture should not depend on whether it is being offered in the Eastern or Western Hemisphere. Therefore, either Eastern researchers or Western researchers must be wrong. As it happens, there are good reasons to believe that the problem lies in the East. The crude reason for blaming Chinese researchers for the discrepancy is that their results are simply too good to be true. 
this criticism has been confirmed by careful statistical analyses of all the Chinese results, which demonstrate beyond all reasonable doubt that Chinese researchers are guilty of so-called publication bias. Before explaining the meaning of publication bias, it is important to stress that this is not necessarily a form of deliberate fraud, because it is easy to conceive of situations when it can occur due to an unconscious pressure to get a particular result. Imagine a Chinese researcher who conducts an acupuncture trial and achieves a positive result. Acupuncture is a major source of prestige for China, so the researcher quickly and proudly publishes his positive result in a journal. He may even be promoted for his work. A year later, he conducts a second similar trial, but on this occasion, the result is negative, which is obviously disappointing. The key point is that this second piece of research might never be published for a whole range of possible reasons. Maybe the researcher does not see it as a priority, or he thinks that nobody will be interested in reading about a negative result, or he persuades himself that this second trial must have been badly conducted, or he feels that this latest result would offend his peers. Whatever the reason, the researcher ends up having published the positive results of the first trial while leaving the negative results of the second trial buried in a drawer. This is publication bias. When this sort of phenomenon is multiplied across China, then we have dozens of published positive trials and dozens of unpublished negative trials. Therefore, when the WHO conducted a review of the published literature that relied heavily on Chinese research, its conclusion was bound to be skewed. Such a review could never take into account the unpublished negative trials. So we need to set aside the WHO report and look at a more neutral group of assessors. But who should we turn to? According to Singh and Ernst, with not enough hours in the day to deal with patients, it would be impractical and nonsensical for doctors to read through each research paper and come to their own conclusions. Instead, they rely heavily on those academics who devote themselves to making sense of all this research and who publish conclusions that help doctors advise patients about the best form of treatment. Perhaps the most famous and respected authority in this field is the Cochrane Collaboration, a global network of experts coordinated via its headquarters in Oxford. Firmly adhering to the principles of evidence-based medicine, the Cochrane Collaboration sets itself the goal of examining clinical trials and other medical research in order to offer digestible conclusions about which treatments are genuinely effective for which conditions. And they're correct. The Cochrane Collaboration, now just known as Cochrane, are among the most highly respected when it comes to making this type of assessment. And what do they conclude about acupuncture? When it comes to a wide variety of conditions, the studies that have been done show that acupuncture is ineffective for most of them. Cochrane concludes that it will not help treat stroke, it will not help with chronic asthma, it will not help with depression, it will not help with epilepsy or glaucoma or vascular dementia or a wide variety of other conditions. I wish it did all those things, but the evidence shows that it doesn't. On the other hand, Singh and Ernst report that Cochrane has found some more promising results for acupuncture. The good news for acupuncturists is that the Cochrane reviews have been more positive about acupuncture's ability to treat other conditions. There have been cautiously optimistic Cochrane reviews on the treatment of pelvic and back pain during pregnancy, low back pain, headaches, postoperative nausea and vomiting, chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting, neck disorders, and bedwetting. Aside from bedwetting, the only positive conclusions relate to acupuncture in dealing with some types of pain and nausea. So there is at least some evidence that acupuncture may help with nausea and pain and bedwetting. However, although these particular Cochrane reviews are the most positive about acupuncture's benefits, it is important to note that their support is only half-hearted. For example, in the case of idiopathic headaches, namely those that occur for no known reason, the review states, quote, Overall, the existing evidence supports the value of acupuncture for the treatment of idiopathic headaches. However, the quality and amount of evidence are not fully convincing, end quote. Because the evidence is only marginally positive and not fully convincing, even in the areas of pain and nausea, 
Researchers have focused their efforts on improving the quality and amount of evidence in order to reach a more concrete conclusion. One also needs to bear in mind that even if acupuncture may work for some forms of pain, there are limits. Uh, Remember the demonstrations Western doctors were shown in China of people undergoing open heart surgery, allegedly using acupuncture instead of anesthetics? Well, it now seems highly likely that many of the Chinese demonstrations involving surgery had been faked, inasmuch as the acupuncture was being supplemented by local anesthetics, sedatives, or other means of pain control. Indeed, it is a deception that has occurred as recently as 2006, when the BBC TV series Alternative Medicine generated national interest after showing an operation that was almost identical to the one observed by Dr. Rosenfeld three decades earlier. Again, acupuncture was being used on a female patient in her 20s, also undergoing open-heart surgery, and also in Shanghai. British journalists and the general public were amazed by the extraordinary images, but a report by the Royal College of Anesthetists cast the operation in a different light. Quote, It is obvious from her appearance that the patient has already received sedative drugs, and I am informed that these comprised midazolam, droperidol, and fentanyl. These doses used were small, but these types of drugs amplify the effect of each other so that the effect becomes greater. Fentanyl is not actually a sedative drug in the strict sense, but it is a pain-killing drug that is considerably more powerful than morphine. The third component of the anesthetic is seen on the tape as well, and that is the infiltration of quite large volumes of local anesthetic into the tissues on the front of the chest where the surgical incision is made, end quote. In short, the patient had received sufficiently large doses of conventional drugs to mean that the acupuncture needles were a red herring probably playing nothing more than a cosmetic or psychological role. The American physicians who visited China in the early 1970s were not accustomed to deception or political manipulation, so it took a couple of years before their naive zeal for acupuncture turned to doubt. Dr. Stephen Novella, professor of neurology at the Yale School of Medicine, also comments on this in his Great Courses series, Medical Myths, Lies, and Half-Truths. There have been several investigative teams in response to these claims and these beliefs sent from the West to China to see firsthand the reality of acupuncture anesthesia. However, all of these investigative teams have failed to confirm that acupuncture anesthesia is a reality. In some cases, they found that morphine was being administered in the IV fluid. Morphine, of course, is a very powerful painkiller, so you can't separate out any pain-relieving effect from the morphine from what is allegedly occurring with the acupuncture. In other cases, patients were found to be complaining of pain, but were pressured by the surgical staff to keep quiet about their pain. So once again, doctors under the thumb of the Chinese Communist Party were faking acupuncture results to make China look good. If there is evidence that acupuncture might work for even a few conditions, how might it work? One thing we can say with confidence is that we don't have any good evidence supporting the traditional explanation for acupuncture. Science has not found evidence for the existence of cosmic forces like yin and yang or the life force chi. I can't rule out that something like chi or life force exists, but it would need to be a spiritual thing rather than a physical reality, something not subject to empirical testing. And there would be no evidence that it flows through the body or that physical objects like needles could manipulate that flow. If acupuncture works for anything, it would be more promising to explain it in terms of physical concepts that are found in modern science. But here we need to be careful. In particular, we need to distinguish what researchers call specific effects from nonspecific effects. In this context, a specific effect is one that you can attribute directly or specifically to the acupuncture. In other words, this effect happened because I put needles into these points on a person's skin at this depth. By contrast, a nonspecific effect is one that happens when you use acupuncture, but not specifically because of the needles. The placebo effect is a classic example of a nonspecific effect. The effect is real, but it's because of the expectations of the patient, 
not a direct effect of the needles. One of the classic ways of sorting out whether an effect is specific or not is by conducting a double-blind study where neither the doctor nor the patient knows whether a therapy is actually being used. For example, if you're testing a new diet pill, you might give half of the test subjects the real pill you're testing and half of them a fake pill that shouldn't have any effect. If the patients who got the test pill lose significantly more weight than the others, then you have evidence that your diet pill works. It really has an effect that's specific to that pill. On the other hand, if both groups lose about the same amount of weight, then the effect isn't specific to your diet pill. It's being caused by something else going on in the experiment. In running the experiment, it's important that the patients don't know which pill they're getting, or it might affect things like how much they eat or how much exercise they get based on their expectation of, hey, I may actually lose some weight here or not. It's also important that the doctors who give them the pills don't know which ones are real so that they don't accidentally, even by their facial expressions, communicate to the patients which type of pill they're on. How would you go about testing whether an effect is specific to the acupuncture needles? It's pretty hard to double-blind acupuncturists and patients to whether needles are being shoved into their skin. Yes, but researchers have found clever ways around this problem. Uh, one of them, this is the older solution, is called sham acupuncture. In sham acupuncture, you do shove a needle into the patient, but you don't do it according to the standard rules of acupuncture. For example, you might just barely prick the skin, but not get the needle down to the depth that's considered therapeutic. Or you might insert a needle into something that's not an acupuncture point, or at least not the right point for the condition you're supposed to be treating. You know, if you want to sham, oh, I'm going to treat his deafness, you shove it into, oh, I'm going to put it in this, you know, pain relieving point instead of the deafness relieving point. Since the patient can't effectively tell how far the needle goes and doesn't know where the acupuncture points for his condition are supposed to be located, this effectively blinds at least the patient, but it does leave the acupuncturist himself unblinded. Quite recently, though, researchers have found a way to blind both the patient and the acupuncturist using what's called placebo acupuncture. In this procedure, they have the needles in an opaque sheath, so neither the practitioner nor the patient can see what's inside. The practitioner then puts the sheath atop an acupuncture point and presses a plunger. If it's a test sheath... A real acupuncture needle is then inserted down to a therapeutic depth. But if it's a placebo sheath, the patient only gets poked. The placebo sheath may contain a needle that's too short to do more than prick the skin, or it may contain a needle that's too dull to be able to penetrate the skin, or it may even just contain a toothpick. The research has shown that the patients cannot tell whether they're just being poked or whether a real needle is going in. So both the patient and the doctor can't see what is inside the sheath, and thus they're both blind. So what did the results of these studies show? In broad terms, sham acupuncture, where you put the needles but not at the correct depth or place, reveals that it doesn't matter where you insert the needles. You get the effect wherever they get inserted. And this suggests that the effect is not due to particular points located on meridians, uh, whether they're the traditional points or the modern ones that were proposed in the 1930s. Placebo acupuncture, where only half the time the patient is needled and half the time he's poked, reveals that it doesn't matter if you insert the needles. So just poking the patient gives you the acupuncture effect. This suggests that the effect is not produced due to the needles being inserted, and thus whatever effect procedure has, it's not specific to the needles. So what besides the needles might be producing the effect? One of the places we should look is the interaction that the acupuncturist has with the patient apart from the needles. In his Great Courses series, Dr. Stephen Novella mentions a friend of his who actually is an acupuncturist, but who nevertheless tells Dr. Novella that he believes all of the benefit 
of acupuncture comes before you stick the needles in, just from the interaction with the patient. And that makes the placebo effect a logical explanation for a good bit of the effects of acupuncture. Think about it. You make a special trip to go to the acupuncturist's office, or you pay him extra to come to your house. He's got, if you're at the office, he's got diplomas hanging on his wall, maybe. He may be wearing a lab coat or other medical garb. He asks you questions and listens to you attentively. He confidently tells you the procedure is going to work. You believe it's going to work. And then you pay him money when you leave the office. When with all that going on, you're rather invested in the idea that this procedure is going to work. And so your perception of the problem, let's say it's pain or nausea, diminishes, either because of your body's natural ability to heal itself when you're optimistic and confident that you're going to heal, or because you're not feeling the pain or the nausea as intensely because of the sunk cost, emotional or financial, in the procedure. This all produces a classic case of placebo. Are there other things that could also help produce the effect? Yeah. You spend a good bit of time in a typical acupuncture treatment in an unusual posture. I mean, if you're being treated for back pain, you may lie on your face on a table for up to 30 minutes, and that might realign things in your body that could help relieve the pain. The therapist might have pleasant music playing that would help you relax and pass the time, and that pleasant music and relaxation could help. The therapist, you know, in in doing the treatment is going to be touching parts of your body and maybe giving them a little bit of massage or stimulation as he manipulates the needles, and that could release tension. Also, remember how I said at the beginning that it's natural to poke at things that hurt? Well, there's a good reason for that. It has therapeutic effects. Poking at things that hurt can release tensions that help things relax and heal. It also has another effect known as counter-stimulation or counter-irritation, which can cause the relief of discomfort. You know, when you bump your knee or your elbow or hit your foot or something, one of your first instincts is likely to rub it. That's counter-stimulation. It, it, you've stimulated it negatively by hitting it or bumping it, and now you stimulate it another way by rubbing it. That makes it feel better because it gives you another sensation to distract you while the pain subsides. In some situations, you don't even have to apply the counter-stimulation to the exact same site that's been injured. For example, suppose the muscles in your shoulder down, you know, an inch or more, you know, an inch under the skin, depending on how much padding you personally have, (laughs) are strained. So the muscles are strained and hurting. But you may put a liniment, including capsaicin, menthol, or camphor, on the skin above the muscles. And the liniment never gets down to the muscles. But the liniment creates a mild inflammation or irritation in the skin. And that gives you something to focus on besides the pain in the muscles underneath. And you can see how that would work with acupuncture. If you're having back pain and they stick needles in your back, it gives you counter stimulation. And even if they put the needle somewhere else, like some of the forms of acupuncture focus on putting needles in your earlobe, well, if you've got back pain, but they put needles in your earlobe, it gives you a sensation in a different part of the body to focus on. So there are good reasons to poke things that hurt or even poke somewhere else. Another nonspecific effect that can crop up in acupuncture is when it's paired with a different therapy that is effective. For example, this happens with electroacupuncture, when you run an electrical charge through the needles. If you have electrified needles at different points in the skin, then you're actually doing a different form of therapy known as transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, which is a proven form of pain relief. Here's how MyClevelandClinic.com describes its mechanism of action. There are two theories about how transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, or TENS, works. One theory is that the electrical current stimulates nerve cells that block the transmission of pain signals, modifying your perception of pain. The other theory is that nerve stimulation raises the level of endorphins, which are the body's natural pain-killing chemical. The endorphins then block the perception of pain. 
Whether TINS works by one method or the other or both, it does work. But that's not to be confused with acupuncture. Dr. Stephen Novella comments. Various interventions are often called acupuncture, even though they have different mechanisms of action. The most notable one, in my opinion, is electroacupuncture. Now, oftentimes I see reports of an acupuncture study that shows a beneficial effect in pain. Therefore, acupuncture works. However, when you read the study, you may find that for some of the, in some cases, the study was actually a study of electroacupuncture. Now, this is important because using electrical stimulation across the, the skin is a proven treatment for pain. In fact, it's called TENS, T-E-N-S, or transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation. So we already know that stimulating the nerves or stimulating the skin can produce a decrease in chronic pain. Now, combining that with acupuncture, however, is just sloppy science. It doesn't get us to the final point of understanding what is it about the intervention that's actually working. Saying that acupuncture works because electroacupuncture works is similar to saying that, well, injecting morphine through a hollow needle reduces pain, therefore acupuncture works. The variable that is consistently associated with an effect is the electricity. It's not anything to do with the acupuncture needle. So, yeah, injecting morphine with a syringe, which would actually be a kind of what's called acupuncture point injection, like we mentioned earlier, would not prove that acupuncture works. It just proves that morphine works. Could regression to the mean be a nonspecific reason that you might feel better after going to an acupuncturist? Yeah, regression to the mean is, in this context, the in general, it's the tendency of something to get back to its normal state. For example, if you start exercising, your heart rate will go up, but when you stop exercising, it will go back to its normal rate. That's your heart regressing to its mean or average rate of beating. The same thing happens with health. Unless a condition spirals out of control and permanently injures or kills you, your body's natural healing ability will cause you to tend to get back to normal. So when you get over a cold, for example, your body goes back to its normal state. Or when you throw your back out, you have pain for a while, but then you heal and the pain goes away. All of that is your body regressing to its mean or average condition. The same thing can happen when you go to an acupuncturist. Your body is trying to heal anyway, you know, to get back to its normal state. And so the reason you feel better after you've had an acupuncture treatment may not be because of the needles. It may simply be because it was your time to start healing and you're just regressing to the mean. And coincidentally, you went and got an acupuncture treatment. Jimmy, at the beginning of the episode, you promised us some special bonus information for Mrs. Ferguson. What is that all about? One of the things that Mr. Ferguson let us know is that she has a curiosity about veterinary acupuncture. And she's aware, for example, of cases where acupuncture seems to help horses. So let's take a look at what we've covered so far and apply it to animals. Well, I don't think we have any reason to see the traditional yin-yang chi explanation of acupuncture as applying to animals any more than it does to humans. And because animals are not humans, you'd have to do clinical testing on each different animal species to see what acupuncture treatments might be effective for them, given what problem they have. You know, I mean, it's the same thing. I mean, we can test mice to find out, might this be promising in humans? But then you got to test the humans because mice are not humans. Same thing with acupuncture. We've done lots of tests on, of acupuncture on humans but you need to replicate those studies to see if it works for animals and which animals and which treatments. But I suspect that in most cases, the results would be similar to what they are in humans. It might have some benefit, particularly for pain relief. The explanations for why would also likely be the same. For example, if you're doing electroacupuncture on a horse, and I checked and, they, and verified they do do that, it would be effective for the same reason that transdermal electrical nerve stimulation is effective on humans. It wouldn't be the needles, it would be the electric current. Also, if the veterinarian is doing other things, like massage or exercise or chiropractic realignment on the animal in addition to the acupuncture, then those things might be the actual effective modalities. 
But if it is the acupuncture itself that's causing the effect, well, counter stimulation by acupuncture needles would work just as well as other forms of counter stimulation. And any other minor effects that acupuncture has for pain relief and nausea might also play a role, such as increasing blood flow or releasing muscle tension. If acupuncture largely works by the placebo effect in humans, could that happen with animals? This point is disputed. You will find some people who say there's no way for animals to have the placebo effect. They don't have the idea of medicine, and so they can't expect a medical treatment to work. But not everyone is convinced by that. And there are others who argue that studies have actually shown the placebo effect in animals. We'll have links to both perspectives so you can read them for yourself. Personally, I think that there is reason to think that the placebo effect is real in some animals, and I can see how it could apply in the case of acupuncture for horses. While animals may not have the conception or be able to conceptualize medicine the way we do, they are sometimes smart enough and social enough to seek out human help when they're in trouble. So they can form the thought, humans can help me. And that expectation, this thing can help, is the core insight driving the placebo effect. An animal may not have the concept of medicine. He may not have any idea what the humans are doing. So it just seems like magic to him, like a witch doctor shaking his beads and rattles. He has avoided two appointments that I've made for his physical exam without reason. That's not at all surprising, doctor. He's probably terrified of your beads and rattles. Nevertheless, even if the animal has no idea what the humans are doing, if it has the idea, humans can help me, that provides a basis for the placebo effect. How do we know that some animals have the idea that humans can help them? This has been shown in a variety of ways, both by experiments and in the wild. For example, some animals are known to seek out human help specifically for medical problems. For example, elephants. In Africa, elephants that have been shot with bullets or poison arrows are reported to regularly show up at veterinary clinics seeking treatment for their wounds. That shows that not only can elephants expect humans to make them feel better when they're hurting, they can even predict which humans will make them feel better as opposed to which humans will hurt them or ignore them. I haven't found references to horses seeking medical help, though that may or may not happen. I, you know, I've, as far as I know, it could go either way. But I have found documentation of horses seeking human help when they're confronted with a problem they can't solve. And that shows that they are capable of conceptualizing that humans can help me. We'll have a link to that study, by the way. And so it's not implausible that if a horse gets used to feeling better after a veterinarian shows up and does magical stuff to the horse that the horse doesn't understand, it can start expecting to feel better after a veterinary visit. And presto, horse placebo effect. In fact, I can see how a horse could have the placebo effect with acupuncture, even if it's never had acupuncture before. I mean, partly that just because the horse associates seeing the veterinarian with feeling better. But it could be something more specific. The horse may associate needles with feeling better if, on previous occasions, the horse has been given injections of medicine that made it feel better. Then, when it's getting an acupuncture treatment, it may assume, oh, that's what's happening. It doesn't know the difference between an acupuncture needle and an injection. So maybe it thinks, oh, they're doing that pokey thing that made me feel better before. Good. I don't like to poke, but I look forward to feeling better. There's even been a parallel experiment done with mice, where mice were initially given a drug to treat a medical condition in combination with sweet water. And eventually, the researchers took away the drug and just gave them the sweet water, and they found the mice reacted to the water the way they did the drug that it was originally paired with. So the mice just know this sweet thing has, makes me feel better, and it kept happening even when they took out the drug. 
So a horse might associate the effects of previous injections with acupuncture, assuming, of course, it's not a horse that's freaked out by needles. What about the role of the horse's owners in all of this? They may be playing a role, too, by what's known as placebo by proxy. That is, the horse's owner may be having the placebo effect. The owner expects the veterinarian's treatments to work, and so the owner is incentivized to see the animal as getting better, whether it is or not. And the owner may be motivated because it's expecting the animal to get better, the owner may be motivated to pay more attention to the animal, to in increase its quality of care a little bit, to talk reassuringly to it, telling it how it's going to get better, which the animal just comes across, you know, to it as reassuring talk, even if it doesn't know what get better means. But it knows it's being reassured and that things are okay. And that's actually really important, especially with horses. They need human reassurance. So the owner may be led to inadvertently help the animal get better because it's the owner who thinks the treatment will work and thus placebo by proxy. And how about regression to the mean in this case? I think regression to the mean could be a very significant reason for the apparent effects of acupuncture on animals. Just like human bodies tend to return to their normal state after being thrown out of whack, so do animal bodies. And so it's possible that an owner may have the vet see their animal at a time and give it acupuncture when the animal's own healing abilities are starting to relieve its symptoms anyway. In fact, I think there's a special reason why this would be even likelier in the case of animals than humans. If you're a human, you know when you're feeling bad and you know how bad it is and you're motivated to go see the doctor as soon as you realize this. But if you're an animal, you know you're feeling bad and you know how bad it is, but you can't call the doctor. You have to wait for the human to notice that something's wrong with you. Then you have to wait for the human to conclude that it's serious enough to call the vet, and only then does an appointment with the vet get made. That means that in the case of animals, it will tend to be later in the process before a medical intervention occurs. So the longer the process goes, the more time the, there is for the body's natural healing abilities to kick in. So unless it's a really serious condition that would permanently wound or kill the animal, there's an increased likelihood that improvements seen after an acupuncture treatment would be due to the animal's natural healing ability causing it to regress to its mean or average condition of health. All right. So that is, seems to be a complete reason perspective. What can we say about acupuncture from the faith perspective? The original form of acupuncture was bound up with the non-Christian religion Taoism, and that religion, like all non-Christian religions, is not compatible with Christian faith in varying ways. Therefore, if acupuncture was to be used in a Christian context, it would need to be purified of those non-Christian elements. And that would be the same thing that the early Christians did when they purified Greek and Roman medical practices of their pagan elements. And there, there were pagan elements in making medicines and in doing medical procedures. All kinds of prayers to the Greco-Roman gods were used. And those pagan elements had to go, but then the remaining purely natural treatments could stay. The same thing would be true here. If it turns out that acupuncture has a therapeutic benefit on some occasions, that benefit would make it legitimate to use in those circumstances. Of course, we'd want to give our best explanation for why it works, and unless some really amazing scientific discoveries get made, that explanation is not going to involve manipulating chi. We could propose other, more modern, scientific mechanisms for why it works. But with the present state of our knowledge, we might not be able to say exactly why it works. And that's not unusual. There are lots of medical interventions, including many drugs, where the mechanism of action is not presently known. Acupuncture would just be one more therapy in that category. It seems to work for this, but we don't know why. The more significant question is whether one can use acupuncture in situations where it's known to just be a placebo. And that gets us into the ethics of placebos, and we'll be doing a future episode just on placebos. So we'll talk about that then. For now, suffice it to say that there is some evidence that acupuncture may have a therapeutic benefit for purely natural reasons. 
and that would justify its use potentially in limited settings like helping with pain or nausea, though one could not oversell it as doing things that we know for a fact it doesn't do, like fixing cancer or diabetes. So, Jimmy, what's your bottom line on acupuncture? Acupuncture is a therapy that grew out of an Eastern medical tradition that was filled with problematic religious and superstitious elements. And in that, it's like Western medicine, which did the same thing. 2,000 years ago, Western medicine had the same problematic religious and superstitious elements in it that Eastern medicine did. Unfortunately, acupuncture has not been as thoroughly purged of those elements as Western medicine, and Western medicine is not perfect in this regard. But there does seem to be a process of purification under the way for acupuncture with the removal of the yin-yang chi explanation for some practitioners, and there are scientific studies being done that will hopefully further purify erroneous ideas and you know, reveal what acupuncture really is good for and why it would work, assuming it's good for anything and does work. Unfortunately, many of the current studies are not high quality, and some of the ones done in China are positively cooked. Between the Chinese Communist Party's propaganda efforts and Western New Age touchy-feely sensibilities, exaggerated claims are being made for acupuncture. And this can be a serious problem if people spend time and money on acupuncture treatments that have no chance of helping them. It's even more problematic when they forego treatments from Western medicine that could help them, sparing them suffering and possibly even saving their lives. But there is at least some evidence that acupuncture could be a benefit in limited circumstances. Whether that evidence will hold up in the future and the precise details of why it would have beneficial effects remain to be seen. All right. So, Jimmy, what do we have for further resources for the listener? We'll have a Sing and Ernst book, Trick or Treatment. Stephen Novella's Great Courses program, Medical Myths, Lies, and Half-Truths, What We Think We May Know May Be Hurting Us. We'll also have articles on acupuncture. We'll have the article, A Brief History of Acupuncture. Ben Cavusi's article, The Untold History of Acupuncture. James Reston's 1971 article, Now About My Operation in Peking, which touched off the acupuncture craze in the U.S., Also, information about transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, or TENS, a skeptical view of animal placebos, a more positive view of animal placebos, information, several pieces about different types of animals, including elephants and horses, seeking human help, including medical help in the case of uh, elephants and also a raven. And so a number of good things for folks to look at. Excellent. So, uh, Jimmy, let's move on to mysterious feedback from our listeners. And this time we're getting feedback on our reincarnation episode, part two. Uh, The first feedback comes from Brooke Kennel, who wrote on YouTube, What a great two-parter. Thanks for getting the follow-up out so quickly. I looked up the Bridie Murphy case on Wikipedia. It said that some researchers cite cryptomnesia for her story, since there were several connections between her Virginia Ties life and the story she told under hypnosis. I was wondering what you guys think of that. It seems to me that she was not consciously misrepresenting anything, especially since she appeared skeptical of reincarnation during the craze. Yeah, I I don't have evidence to accuse Virginia Ty of an attempted deception. Whether cryptoamnesia is part of the reason for what she came up with. I am sure that's true to a certain degree, but uh, because we all forget where we learn stuff. But I I am cautious about the claims made in this case, uh, because one of the things you'll remember is we talked about this Hearst newspaper chain expose that was done on her. And actually, a bunch of the crypto amnesia claims came from that. Uh. And that expose was later itself shown to be very problematic. And so I that's why we didn't go into it more, because it's like, oh, she had an Irish whatever that she would have learned this stuff from. And and that's not actually it's not actually verified she had contact with that person. So that's that's part of why we didn't go into that more. Excellent. Robert Leonard also wrote on YouTube, the classic book against pseudoscience, Martin Gardner's In the Name of Science was written shortly after this sensation, ripping it to shreds. It is truly astounding that anyone could still find Bradie Murphy in any way convincing. 
And I want to say with Martin Gardner, he now he's a skeptic, although he by the end of his life, he was uh, he believed in God and an afterlife. And so he had he was an open minded one. And he there is a bunch of good stuff in what he does. But his critique of the Bridie Murphy situation is heavily based on the Hearst investigation. And since we were avoiding the Hearst investigation, that's why I didn't quote his book. He had a bunch of good stuff, but it was all tainted by this Hearst investigation. So unfortunately, I can't recommend Gardner on Bridie Murphy. But on other things, he has some good things to say. Okay. Uh, Veil of Reality writes on YouTube, Oh, please, disproving Braddy Murphy's ridiculous case doesn't disprove reincarnation. This is blatant straw manning. You want to challenge real serious work on reincarnation? Then look into Ian Stevenson's extensive body of work. We will. As we mentioned in the two-parter we did to start our investigation of reincarnation, we focused on Bridie Murphy because it's the most popular one that people will know about. Uh, And as I promised at the end of that two-parter, we will look at reincarnation in the future and we will be keeping an open mind and looking at other studies, including those of Ian Stevenson, who has done a lot of work on this area. All right. So, Jimmy, uh, what do we have for mysterious headlines this week? Well, since we mentioned trepanation earlier, where you drill holes in somebody's head, we have an article on why our ancestors drilled holes in each other's heads. (laughs) And it's even though it almost certainly was to treat headaches and other head problems at times, it also seems to possibly have had other cultural and even religious functions. So Hmm. check that out. Why our ancestors drilled holes in each other's heads. And, you know, It wasn't just the ancients that drilled holes in people's heads. We do it today, too. In fact, Elon Musk is presently planning on drilling holes in people's heads to put in a device called Neuralink. He wants to do start doing Neuralink testing on human beings that will connect their brains to computers and, for example, allow people with motor control problems or missing limbs or things like that to be able to better interface with their environment using a brain connection. So uh, today we have a need it like a hole in the head theme for our (laughs) mysterious headlines, whether it's our ancestors needing holes in their heads or Elon Musk wanting to put holes in people's heads. I I love my iPhone, my iPad, my Mac. I am not letting anyone put one of those in my head. There's enough bugs in them as it is. (laughs) (laughs) I would be more open to uh, heads up display contact lenses. Mm. Uh, By the way, if you want to see an interesting fictional depiction of trepanation uh, in the movie Master and Commander, which takes place in Uh the uh, early 19th century age of sale, there's a scene in which the uh, doctor uh, Stephen uh, does a trepanation to one of the sailors. So, uh, Ouch. It, yeah, and all the other sailors gather around to see this uh, very interesting <laughs> operation take wow. place. So, uh, it's, it's if you could stomach it, that's it's interesting. So, I, I do want to make an appeal for the listeners for your feedback. What are your theories about acupuncture or your experiences? We'd love to hear both of those, and you can let us know about that by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page. You can send an email to mysterious at sqpn.com or you can send a tweet to at mys underscore world with the hashtag of mysterious feedback. So, Jimmy, what's our next episode going to be about? Our next episode is going to be about St. Thomas Aquinas and the occult. Excellent. So be sure to share the podcast with your friends and write a review of the podcast if you can in Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. That helps us grow the uh, audience of our body of listeners, this community that was formed around this podcast, and it reaches all kinds of new folks who might benefit from listening to Mysterious World. You can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion and links to the mysterious headlines on our show notes at sqpn.com slash mysterious. And remember, to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Dom, and happy birthday, Mrs. Ferguson. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest and... Happy birthday.